Within the teaching of ESL throughout the world, there's a whole spectrum of the types of groups that you may be involved in. And it's worth us breaking those types of groups down to have a look at some of the more specific things that we need to do when we're teaching those groups. So we'll have five classifications, first of all. Our first classification might be the beginner. Secondly, we'll have a look at teaching individuals throughout the world. This is a very large area of ESL, what we often call one-to-one -one teaching. Our third category is going to be what we might call young learners, or the teaching of, of children. Another category is that of English for specific or special purposes, and perhaps the biggest group here may be the Business English group. And finally, our final category is going to be based on the groups of monolingual or multilingual classes. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll take a look at each of those categories and see what particular things we specifically need to do for teaching those special groups. The first thing to bear in mind when we're looking at the category of beginners is that beginners can be of any age. So really what we should do is to break this category down into a number of subcategories. Our first group we may call the absolute beginner. We could have what are called false beginners. Another category may be the adult beginners and therefore the category of young beginners. And our final one beginners without the Roman alphabet. So just to quickly run over what these different types of beginners are, the absolute beginner, as the name implies, are those people with no language knowledge in that particular language. So they've never been taught it, and they've probably had no exposure to it either. This is different to the false beginner. The false beginner is at the beginner level, but they've had some exposure to the language. This could be that they were taught it a long time ago, and they've now forgotten it all. Or perhaps they've had some exposure to the language through tourism, or even TV and radio. The adult and young beginners, obviously those categories are fairly self-explanatory. The only difference comes between where we recognize the young beginner to finish and the adult beginner to start. Typically, we're looking at an age somewhere between 16 and 18 for the separation of those categories. The final ones, the beginners without Roman alphabet, obviously the types of lessons that we're going to be doing at the start of that course is going to have to include very simple structures such as the actual alphabet itself. Within all of those categories there are some general rules that we need to keep in mind whichever type of beginner we are teaching. So regardless of which type of beginner class you are teaching, here are our top ten tips, if you like, for the teaching of beginners. The first thing is to keep it simple. The 
you have to remember when teaching beginners that your language level has to be at the same level or at least slightly above theirs, otherwise they're not going to understand you. One of the ways in which we can reduce that language level down to its lowest possible value is to be visual rather than verbal. Certainly at the starter level, and within all levels in fact, visual information is a far easier way to transmit that information than trying to talk about it. What we also need to do as often as possible is to get those language learners talking. It's through the use of the language that they're going to learn it the quickest. One of the ways in which we can help to keep them uh, talking is to often use questioning and repetition. So repetition drills for pronunciation and so on and so forth. Another thing that will help to keep them talking is to use pair work. Individuals working on their own have no real reason to talk to each other. What we want to do is to get them talking as much as possible and by using pair work we maximise their opportunity for student-to-student -student interaction. Another thing, always try to be supportive and praise as often as possible. Praise will increase the student's confidence and will also get them used to the idea that when they give an answer, they can expect to be praised for that. Next thing, always respond to the individual needs of the students. At the starter level, or the beginner level particularly, there are going to be a whole range of individual needs that different students will have. Next, it's very, very important that you are patient. You cannot expect the students to pick up everything that you say immediately, so you need to be patient and you need to be prepared to cover material again. Next, what we need to do is to play lots of games. What interactive games will allow you to do is to get the students talking to each other as often as possible and often that's in some form of realistic context by using a game. And finally, I think it is quite important that we don't overcorrect. Students' confidence can be brought down very quickly if we correct every single mistake that they make and making mistakes is part of the learning process so try only to correct where absolutely necessary. Our next category is that of individuals as we mentioned this is also known as teaching one-to-one. -one. It forms a very large part of the ESL teaching market. Teaching one-to-one -one has some positive and negatives about it. Perhaps the main positive is that because you've only got that single student, you're only ever working at one level. So there's no chance of any mixed ability with one student. Perhaps the main potential negative point, if we're not careful, is that there is very little dynamic with only two people. That means that you as the teacher will quite often have to become involved in the actual lesson process itself. 
So here are a few ideas just to bear in mind when you are teaching one-to-one. -one. Firstly, because you only have one student, it is quite important that before you actually start the course, you do some form of needs analysis. There's an example of a needs analysis in your unit, and if you have a look at that, you'll see that the idea is to find out what the student already knows, what they are going to need to know from their English learning programme, and then you can then, from that needs analysis, start to create a syllabus. Another thing with teaching one-to-one -one is that it's quite important that you concentrate your teaching on their interests. There is a potential with only one student for it to become quite boring, so if you focus your teaching around the areas that you know they're interested in, that will help to keep your lessons uh, exciting. Also, despite what the student may think that they need, it is important that you cover all of the skills. They may want to try to avoid listening skills, but it's important for you as the teacher to make sure that they get an equal coverage of all four skills. With there only being one person, it's also very important that you vary your activities as often as possible. Within that, we may even say to vary your approach, not only your activities. So the way in which you try to teach should be varied as often as possible to try to keep it fresh. Our next category is that of the young learners, and we'll take that as being anywhere between the age of two. Uh, there are English classes for children aged two onwards, up to perhaps the age of 16. One thing about young learners is that they tend, usually at least, to be self-motivated and enthusiastic, and they can keep up their self-esteem through a number of different things. So try to bear in mind when you're teaching young learners that you want to constantly praise them. When their self-esteem is high, they're much more likely to learn in an effective way. Do a lot of repetition. Again, in the form of verbal drills, singing songs, and all those sorts of uh, activities. Make sure that your speech is slow and simple. There is little point with our younger learners in using language that they don't even know in their own native language. So try to keep your language as simple as possible. Always try, whenever possible, to reference the individual person. So rather than talking to them as a whole group, when something has not gone right, try to individual, uh, reference the individual. You need to be aware that as young learners they're going to have a very short attention span and therefore you need to prepare for that. So you need a lot of activities prepared because they will have a very short attention span. And perhaps most important of all, particularly for young learners, is to keep it fun. So here are some general do's and don'ts for the teaching of, of young learners. Firstly, within your lessons you must always use English as the language of instruction. You need to speak slowly.
and you need to reduce the amount of teacher talk time by using gesture and mime as often as possible. And finally, for the list of do's, do play games as often as possible. But bear in mind that the games that we're suggesting here are interactive, communicative games that have some educational purpose. As an opposite to this one, don't use their native language. As soon as they know that you have some appreciation of their native language, quite often they'll just sit and wait for you to use it. So here, always use English as the language instruction. Don't use their native language. With young learners, it's quite important that we don't put them on the spot because that can let, uh, cause them to lose their confidence very, very quickly. One way that we can reduce that of ever happening is obviously to use pair work with our students. Obviously, at this young age, we can't expect them to have everything that they're going to need within the lesson, so don't expect them to have what they need. At this young age, we tend to be quite forgetful, so we may not have a pen or a piece of paper, and we need to be prepared for that when we come to the lesson. Perhaps the final thing that we can put in the don't one, and it, well, we could put the opposite in the do, is that we shouldn't ever be afraid of making fun of ourselves. Our lessons can be much more entertaining for example, if we're learning about the vocabulary of animals, if we, as the teacher, actually act out what those animals are at the very start. So we shouldn't be afraid of being self-conscious. So finally in this section, just some ideas around the discipline within young learners groups. Again, some things to do and some things not to do. Firstly, try to make yourself aware of any problems that they do have, either within school or outside of school, because they can affect the way that they're going to learn. You need to change the dynamic of the classroom as often as possible. And this can relate to the actual seating arrangement within the classroom, who they work with in terms of pair work or who they work with in terms of groups. So try to change that dynamic as, as often as you can. Always be fair and consistent within the uh, operating rules that you have within the classroom. And again, change your activities as often as possible to keep people motivated and fresh throughout your lessons. All of these do's will help you with the discipline within the classroom. Some things which can cause discipline to degrade is when you are inconsistent. Secondly, when you set out a set of rules for the students and you actually break them yourself. If 
you say that no one should be talking when you are talking, then you shouldn't interrupt your students in that way either. Very important not to use physical punishment. And finally, it is very important, particularly in different cultures, that you don't get angry. Our next category is that of English for specific purposes. And perhaps the main subcategory here is that of teaching business English. The first thing to say here is that many teachers worry that they're not going to be able to teach business English because they don't know anything about business. This is actually a misconception. If you think about it, 90% of the language used within any business English context is going to be the same as within general English. Obviously, within a business context, there's going to be certain words that are relevant to that particular context, but those will be very few and far in between. Also remember that you're not there to teach them about business, they already know that. What you are there for is to teach them English. Within the business English setting, there are often different types of ways in which they can be taught. So, as with general English, within business English, we can also have the individual learner or the one to one. Another type of situation that you may get is where within a company, the whole department within a company will come to your school. Or well, the final type of situation that you may get is that you will be invited by the company to teach in the company itself. So within each of those settings, there are a number of common factors that we need to consider when teaching business English. So here are some of the more common problems that can be associated with business English classes, and they're things that we need to be aware of as teachers. Firstly, we need to bear in mind that very often our students will have been working all day before they come to their English classes, and so very often our students are going to be tired. We need to be aware of that and we need to take account of that within our lessons. Secondly, if the students come to us from a particular department, which is very often used, the whole department comes across for their English lesson at once, then it's very unlikely that all the students within that department are going to be at the same level. So we need to be prepared for mixed ability classes. Obviously, we cannot present the same information in exactly the same way to all of those students if it's a mixed ability class. So we have to make considerations such as differentiated activities that have varying levels within them. Another thing you need to be aware of is that students will not always be able to attend your lessons.
So it could be that they have another meeting somewhere else within the company or they're off visiting clients somewhere else and so their attendance could well be erratic. And finally, for your business English classes, do be aware that they're going to have different motivations for being there. If the company has decided that all of their employees will have to learn English up to a certain level, there may well be students in that class who don't really want to be learning English. So you have to be aware that they are going to have different motivations. It is very important in that situation, therefore, to find out what these people are interested in, what they're going to be using their English for, find out something about the jobs that they actually do, and try to tailor your teaching to make it as specific as possible. Regardless of which particular business English setting you find yourself teaching in, here's a typical process that we would recommend that you go through before you actually start teaching your course. So to start with, It's very important that you level test each member of your group and from that level test you can put them into the different categories. Within those categories themselves you then need to do a needs analysis and the needs analysis will tell you what type of information they're going to need to know by the end of your course. They're an example of both a level test and a needs analysis within your course units. It's very often next if you, you, uh, if you get your group together, first of all, and do a group needs negotiation. So you and your group discuss what it is that they need to get out of your course what it is they're expecting your course to teach them and you can try to guide them along the lines of where your syllabus is actually going to show uh, to, to take them. Once you've done those three things you're then in a position to plan out your syllabus. Regardless of the length of the course, we would suggest that you don't take that planning of the progression of the syllabus too far initially, but that you find out whether the methodology that you're using and the types of lessons that you've created is actually working. If everything seems to be okay, then you can continue to plan that syllabus. Once that has been done and you've, been, you've done some teaching, it's very important to do some testing and evaluation at various parts of your course. So at various stages you need to do some progress tests. By the time your course is finished, it's also very important that you do some form of post-course evaluation. You need to know from the students, and the students are going to be the best judges of the information that you've been able to pass over to them, what do they think your course was about and what do they think needs to be changed. That can then help the next set of people who come in to do that course. So now for our business English setting, let's consider some do's and don'ts within those settings. Firstly, you are not going to know everything about their particular business and you could actually use your ignorance of that to your advantage. So if you're teaching a group of banking employees, you may not know about the particular areas of work that they do and use that to their advantage. So when they're using terms that are used within the banking system, then you can say, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Can you explain that to me? So they're actually getting more language practice. 
It's very useful as well to find out what they actually do in their jobs. So perhaps ask the employer if you can actually shadow your clients and go around and see what they actually do. If you know exactly what their job involves, then you're going to know how to tailor their English language learning to that particular job. It is very important within the business English uh, setting that you be professional at all times. And until you know otherwise, that should be in terms of both dress and in your demeanor and attitude towards your clients. And it is very important within a business English session that you keep records. Very often the employers will want to know about their individual clients and you should therefore be able to have a meeting with them and tell them how each of their clients are doing from the records that you have kept. Some of the things to be aware that you need to try and avoid within the business English session uh, within the business English area is not to talk about people within the company. The second thing that we would recommend that you don't do is, as with young learners, don't expect them to bring everything that they may need for the class. A number of reasons why they might not bring what they need. They'll be tired, first of all, because they've probably been working all day. And secondly, their motivation may be such that they're hoping that they can get out of things. So bring every, all the materials that you're going to need. And as with young learners, don't use their native language. Our final grouping that we're going to look at is the differences between, between teaching monolingual and multilingual classes. Firstly, we should define what we mean by these two things. Monolingual students are a group of students that all have the same native language. And typically, that's taught in the country. So an example of that could be the teaching of English to Thai students in Thailand. The chances are that the vast majority of your class will all speak Thai, so they all have the same L1. The difference with a multilingual class is that the students will have a range of first languages. So they have different L1s. An example there may be the teaching of English to a group of students in an English-speaking country, for example, in England. Whether your class is monolingual or multilingual, it brings with it a range of advantages and disadvantages. So let's have a look at what some of those could be. So let's have a run through the advantages, first of all, for the monolingual and the multilingual classes. For a monolingual class, because they all come from the same country and speak the same language, they're going to have some common difficulties.
this is an advantage to us as the, as the teacher because we can work on those common difficulties with the whole class. Secondly, because they're all from the same country, they will be culturally similar. And finally, another advantage with the monolingual class is that they can actually help each other in their native language. What potential disadvantages are there with having a monolingual class? Well, secondly, they can help each other in their L1, and whilst this may be okay at the lower levels, say up to pre-intermediate, and in fact, it can often actually be more effective to allow them to do so, at the higher levels, we should be discouraging that. So the fact that they are able to talk to each other in their L1, we should try and discourage that at the higher levels. Secondly, they will have uh, less natural exposure to L2 as a monolingual class. If you remember, we said an example of a monolingual class was teaching English to Thai students in Thailand. They're going to have less natural exposure to the English language in Thailand than they would in England. So what about the multilingual class? What are some of the advantages of teaching those? One of the advantages is that they have no common language. They come from uh, different countries throughout the world and they all speak a different uh, first language. So the fact that they have no common language is actually an advantage to us because their only common language in that situation is therefore going to be English. Another advantage of a multilingual class, because they come from different countries throughout the world, they will have a large variety of experiences, and those experiences can be used within our classroom. Another advantage that the multilingual class will have is because they're learning the language in an English-speaking country, they are going to have more exposure to that English language. Some of the disadvantages, well, here we had the fact that they have common difficulties. Within the multilingual class, it's a disadvantage. So some students may find some concepts very easy because it's closer to their native language than others, and therefore there are no common difficulties. So we may be having to explain to a particular type of student from a particular country about certain things that the whole class is, is okay with. And finally, One potential disadvantage, if we're not careful, is that because they come from different ethnic backgrounds, we need to be very, very careful to be culturally aware of what we're doing within the classroom. 